So one of the things that is most important in the estate planning process uh, is the estate administration process. And uh, we like to refer to that as maturity of the plan. So we have planning and then we have maintenance of the plan, the estate plan or elder law plan, or even a special needs plan. And then we have the maturity of the plan or the administration. So what we wanna do today for you is go over the basics. Uh, and some of you have kindly uh, given me your feedback over the years and said, Steve, you know, we'd like to see more real life examples. We would like to, to get into more of the mechanics of what happens in the administration process. So I promise we're going to do that today. Um, but basically we're going to take time of our, of our beautiful June day here to unravel the mystery of what happens upon the death of a loved one. Uh, we're wanna, we want to minimize confusion and provide support to clients and family members if you're not a professional advisor at the time of a crisis. And we want to know what is the legal step-by-step -step process that needs to be taken after death. And as we get started here, I want to recognize that we have many people uh, on this call. We have professional advisors. We have people who just want to further their knowledge, and I salute you for that. We have people who are engaged currently in administering an estate or trust, and we have people who are trying to get ready for such a possibility. So uh, we want to recognize that uh, this presentation tries to speak to everyone, and uh, if you'll just bear with me, we are trying to generalize this information so that everybody can walk away with something from this, whether you're a client or a prospective client or someone who's trying to administer an estate or a professional advisor. One thing we do know is the state administration is a fine art and it's very, very important. So let's get into the discussion. So what are the practical steps that should be followed in addition to the bullet points I just covered? What are significant legal and tax issues that advisors should be aware of following a client's death? And how should fiduciaries, personal representatives, trustees and financial advisors CPAs and attorneys, how can they all work together to best support families, clients, and so forth? So one of the biggest concerns clients have when they come to do estate planning or elder law planning is, uh, you know, what is going to actually happen after the death of a loved one? I can't tell you how many times, with couples especially, but with all clients, that someone will say to me, uh, what happens, for example, if I have a revocable living trust, what happens upon my death? How does that trust get administered? Believe it or not, that's one of the greatest of client concerns. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of ambiguity, okay? We want to understand probate. We want to understand the difference between probate and non-probate. Uh, we want to understand how a trust gets administered. And we want to understand that a trust let's say a will substitute like a revocable trust is nothing more again than a will substitutes, but it does have administration. And sometimes there is this sense of confusion that a revocable trust requires no administration. And that would not be true except in the very, very limited cases, uh, which I'll try to remember to, to expound on. And then there's a transitionary period after someone dies. Uh, so this administrative process uh, it is the greatest, the greatest concern. concern. So I'm going to try, try, to, try to, to clarify that. Uh, we want to talk, uh, talk about the there will be surviving children, children and, 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 and spouses. spouses. What, what can they do? What should they do? Uh, should they be driven by a process? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, they should not panic. Uh, there's a sense of, with some people, that they need to react or act very quickly. And that's not necessarily uh, advisable and it's not needed in the majority of cases. Now, sometimes it is needed, for example, let's say someone passes away and they have a lot of rental real estate. And that kind of management of properties can't just sit there. It has to be tackled kind of quickly after someone passes away. But other than those kinds of situations, there's no real concern about rushing into the administration process. And that's more of the human side of administration. But we wanna prepare for this process at the end of our lives or handling this process for the end of someone else's life 
through planning and education and organization. So along those lines, I wanted to just briefly show you, and hopefully you have this, and I saw this in the webinar materials. This is the actual PowerPoint presentation I'm giving today, and I want you to please use that as a tool. It is certainly not technical, and it's not something that you would rely on as legal advice per se, but it is certainly something that you would rely on as a guideline. I also have provided what I will call critical dates checklists. I've given you a critical date checklist for a trust administration, critical date checklist for an estate administration. And you can find these online now. There's nothing magical about them. But I want to encourage you, again, to be driven by a process that is kind of checked off as you go along because do we have liability as fiduciaries? Um, the answer is yes, whether that's uh, legal liability because of something we didn't do that we should have done, uh, tax liability, uh, a moral responsibility to someone who you promised you would take care of their affairs, accountability to siblings or other loved ones that you're accounting for everything in the estate. All these things would, would uh, kind of contribute to the idea that you should have a process and be driven by that. So I'm going to give you some case examples here today. Some of them are very specific to a particular type of estate plan. The estate plan structure is there. The clarity of that structure is there. No problem, but we're driven by, a, let's say, a structure. Um, Asset-specific types of plans. Uh, what if we have a mixture of assets that are causing a little bit of complexity in that plan? Maybe there's a lot of retirement type assets, and maybe there's a lot of situated non-probate assets. I know uh, on a practice level, I see a lot of non-probate assets that advisors are advising their clients to position. Transferable on death assets and brokerage accounts instead of using the client's revocable trust. So what if someone has a very nice estate plan, uh, and that plan is beautiful in every way, but what if the, the assets are being driven by non-probate transfers like transfer on death? We, we might have a mixture of assets. What if there's a specific need? There's a survivor situation that is really different than what happened when the person who died made the plan. So there might be a situation there that doesn't make a whole lot of sense as far as the plan said to do this, but now we have this situation. So what do we do? Uh, is there any flexibility built into that plan? Uh, um, what if it was, it's another fact-specific situation where there's really just no planning, we just have a set of facts, or there's a very poor plan, and the fiduciary, again, just like I just mentioned, the fiduciary, the personal representative or the trustee, has to make some kind of judgment call. So we see a lot of this in elder law, for example, where there are no clear-cut examples. So a, a clear-cut uh, answers is what I meant to say. So if you're administering an estate or trust and you see something uh, that, that you just say, wow, this is ambiguous, just know that sometimes this happens. We are driven by a process. We want to kind of orchestrate the, est the estate or trust administration. And it can be very much an orchestrated step-by-step -step process that actually can be very uh, satisfying intellectually. But there are times when things won't make sense and we have to make judgment calls. There's lots of times when that happens. So let's just get into some case examples. And many of you have asked me to really focus on these today. So I'm going to do my best to do that. And I'm giving you an example here of a single person. So we will call this person uh, Felix. He was a single person. He was never married, but he has a, he has a child. So this person has passed away. If you look at the bottom of the slide, this person has an estate plan. So he's one of the minority of people who has an estate plan in this country. Uh, he has a will, and his will is very simple. So everything goes outright to his son, Charles. And so let's just see what goes through probate, because we've got a situation here where right away, when we look at the limited set of facts I just, just talked about, what do we know? We know we have a single person. We know we have no, no spouse involved. We know we, this person is, is not young. He's 77, uh, although arguably that is still young today. 
and he has one child, Charles. We have no information that Charles is disabled. Uh, it's, it's all just very straightforward. So that, now that we know that, we know that we're going to be dealing with an estate. But let's see if we have any estate assets, okay? Because what do we know about probate? We know that probate is a process, and in some states that process is more onerous than others. So for example, in Virginia, my understanding is that probate is very straightforward compared to Maryland. So we, in Maryland, we, we still have a pretty robust probate process. So here we have to figure out, do we have anything in Felix's name? Do we have anything in Felix's name that is solely owned by him, solely owned, with no beneficiary and no joint owner? No beneficiary and no joint owner. So let's look at these assets. And the answer is yes, we do have some of those assets. Typical residence what would you do as a personal representative to know that his residence was worth $300,000? Well, you would most of the time get an appraisal. There are some limited circumstances where an appraisal would not be something that is done, and perhaps the personal representative would rely on the state assessment, the State Department of Assessments and Taxation real estate assessment. So, that is not acceptable in some circumstances, and it is acceptable in others. Nine or eight or nine times out of 10, we want to get a formal appraisal. So one of the first duties of the personal representative is to get date of death values. When we open up this estate and we know we're dealing with a will and an estate, what else do we know? This is a regular estate. It's an estate of more than $50,000. So the personal representative will have a petition for probate that's going to be completed, and they will petition for probate. It's a regular estate, and we know, just looking at this residence, that residence was in the sole name, and we're going to verify that it had no remaindermen. So let's say that he owned a residence by deed, and it was in his sole name, it had no beneficiary, so to speak. It had no remainderman from a life estate for Felix with a remainder to Charles. This is not that situation. He owns it, he owns it outright in his sole name. So that is in probate. Checking savings and CDs, $200,000. Significant cash is sitting there. So what do we know? Well, according to this set of facts, uh, this is in his sole name, there is no POD, payable on death beneficiary. There is no POD beneficiary of the CD, the certificate of deposit. So what do we know? This is in probate. Now we look at his IRA. What is the first thing we're going to do other than determine the date of death values? We're going to make sure there's a beneficiary. And that beneficiary is probably Charles. But are there times when the beneficiary is missing? And the answer is yes. The beneficiary could be missing, God forbid. And if that were the case, I say God forbid, because now that IRA is going to be basically subject to immediate taxation. It will be payable to the estate. So it will not be in the estate if it has a beneficiary. If it does not have a beneficiary, it will be in the estate. And it will be subject to probate, which is unfortunate. It will also be subject to the default rule of five years. This IRA has to be taxed in no more than five years. And what we, what we know in practical terms is that the IRA will be subject to almost immediate taxation as part of the estate administration process. I saw a case uh, a few years ago where uh, I was looking at a special needs plan and I saw the estate of the deceased person who left money to the special needs beneficiary, and I noticed that there was about $300,000 of tax, not just $300,000 of an IRA, but $300,000 of income tax in the estate. And when I inquired to find out why that had happened, it was because the deceased person, the decedent, had died with no beneficiary. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to immediately check for beneficiaries. So, so far, what do we know? Our residents, the checking and savings and CDs are in probate. The IRA hopefully is not in probate because it has a beneficiary. Now we look at the savings bonds. 
savings bonds are, unless there's a joint owner or a payable on death beneficiary, savings bonds are in the estate. Excuse me, I just had a pop-up on my screen. Savings bonds are in the estate in this example because we have no joint owner and we have no payable on death beneficiary. Now, what do we know about savings bonds? Taxation is due upon the death of the decedent when those bonds are cashed, okay? And we know we have a unique situation here. Not only are those bonds includable in probate, but we have to figure out how the income tax is going to be paid on those. So if we're dealing with a savings bond situation, and this is pretty substantial, I've seen some estates that had more or less savings bonds in them, but we've got an issue here of who's going to pay the tax. So your CPA or attorney is going to look at this issue, and in many cases, it will not just be the decedent paying the taxes, it might be the decedent, the decedent's estate, and the beneficiaries might all three share in the taxation to try to get the tax as low as possible. So, so far, we know we have a probate estate and we have a regular probate estate. It is more than $50,000. So we're going to submit our petition to probate for probate and we're going to receive letters of administration. Now, because those of you who have gone through this workshop before, you want more specifics, you'll notice I'm being more specific here. So bear with me as we go through a little bit further into this particular fact pattern. When you submitted your petition for probate, you included a copy of the original will. So hopefully that existed and you knew where it was and you submitted the original will along with the death certificate and the petition for probate. Now, if this was a nice, well-drafted will, it's going to excuse the personal representative from bond. And we want to make sure that in all good wills, they have this clause that say, I'm excusing my personal representative from posting bond. But what do we know about that? That simply means the personal representative does not have to post a full bond. So uh, we still have to post what is called a nominal bond. So it will just cost a little bit of money, probably a couple hundred dollars, to have the bond excused except for the nominal bond. So you'll be submitting your petition to probate, most likely using a nominal bond and so forth to get the estate open. Now, do we have to tell the Register of Wills exactly how much everything is worth at the time the estate is open? And the answer is no. You can ballpark how much everything is worth. Uh, that's been my experience. And we do not have to provide exact date of death values, because remember I said that was one of your first and foremost responsibilities as a personal representative, we do not have to provide that until three months after the estate is open. That is when the inventory and information report is due. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But so far, we've gotten our estate open and we have our letter of administration. Now, depending on how, much, uh, how many assets we have will depend on how many letters of administration we need. These are the official letters with the raised seal this gives us the authority as personal representatives to take charge of the estate assets, okay? So that's what you're going to do with that, with that letter of administration. Now, the IRA, if it has a beneficiary, you're going to facilitate for Charles, and of course, in this particular instance, Charles might be the personal re representative himself. For those of you who don't know what that is, the personal representative is the person who is in charge of administering the estate. In some states, we call this the executor. So the personal representative and the executor, those terms are synonymous. And in this situation, uh, Charles gets everything outright. He's probably the personal representative. But I'm analogizing this fact pattern to something you might be dealing with someday. So we have the estate open. Now you can take charge of the assets we're going to get a tax ID number. This estate has to have an EIN. It is now an entity. This is now um, uh, an estate that has to have a federal tax ID number. That's no big deal. You're going to take that federal tax ID number, generally speaking, and you're going to go open an estate account. And that can be opened at any credit union, at any bank. And that is the account that you're going to, nine times out of 10, you're gonna deposit cash into that account 
you're going to cash out those savings bonds and you're going to put that money in that state account. I'm being very general here in my uh, overview just to give you a feel for the, the administration process. Now you have an account that A, you can be reimbursed from if you have paid for final expenses. By the way, the Register of Wills will want to know as one of its first priorities, how are the final expenses being paid? They want to know uh, if you have receipts for how that was paid. They want to make sure the funeral director and funeral home or crem crematory has been paid. All those things are very essential to getting the estate open. So, so far we've opened the estate, we've taken charge of the assets, we've opened an estate administration account, and uh, we've given notice to creditors. So creditors are going to be given notice in an estate, in a probate estate, and the register of wills is going to facilitate that, even though each register of wills does things differently to some degree. That is the notice that you've seen in the newspaper many times, notice the creditors of someone's death. So, so far, so good. And now we look at this fact pattern again. We see that as we are administering the estate, we are asking ourselves, well, when we finally determine what the total value of assets are, and you'll notice here that there is no life insurance. So life insurance would not be part of the probate estate as long as it has a beneficiary. So let's assume here that Felix has no life insurance. Uh, so we know that he's given no lifetime gifts and we don't think he has any creditors. Now, what if creditors make a claim against Felix's estate? Well, they have six months to do so in Maryland. There is an alternate way to notify creditors, which I won't go into too much today. The standard way of doing it is to allow creditors to be notified, and they have six months from the date of death. Six months from the date of death, not from the date the estate was opened. Six months from the date of death to make a claim, and that's called a verified claim. Now, there are various points of view about this in different states and in different uh, uh, studies of the law and different ethical studies about when does a personal representative have the, um, the obligation to honor the claim of a creditor. Uh, so that's something that's beyond the scope of this discussion today. But generally speaking, unless a creditor makes a verified claim with the Register of Wills, Within six months of the date of death in Maryland, that creditor, unless they are an exception creditor like Medicaid, uh, uh, that creditor does not have to be paid. Now, many personal representatives want to go ahead and pay creditors even though uh, there's no claim. And of course, if a claim is made, then the claim can be disputed if it's not a valid claim. What you want to do as a personal representative is recognize that the Register of Wills has a system where you can go online and you can see the status of an estate and you want to see if there's any creditors that have made claims. So just know that generally speaking and very generally speaking, you do not as a personal representative have to pay the debts of a decedent unless the creditors have made a claim or a creditor has made a claim. Here's an example. Let's pretend that it's Bank of America. The creditor, I'm using them as an example because they are so forefront in my mind about this particular issue. Let's say the decedent has a credit card, $3,000. Notice is posted in the newspaper that the decedent has died. My point of view or my experience is that nine, 95 times out of 100, Bank of America is going to make a claim, for example, against that estate for that $3,000. So that would have to be paid before the estate is distributed. Now, back to the question here about lifetime gifts and so forth, we know that Felix could give away 11.58 million during his lifetime, uh, not just 15,000 per year per person. He could actually make bigger gifts, but here he's made no gifts, and we know his total assets are under 11.58 million, which is the estate tax exemption that we currently have in this country for each individual. So we're not worried about gift tax, we're not worried about uh, estate tax, and we are not worried about inheritance tax because Charles is a child. He is a descendant of Felix. He is not subject to inheritance tax. So, so far, I hope I've given you some real substantive ideas about this particular fact 
pattern that looks so simple, but I've been asked today to go into more detail about the actual administration process. And uh, of course, each fact pattern is going to be different, but that's how this estate would get going. And um, those are some of the concerns I would have if I start uh, the, the estate. Now, um, Jeff, I'm going to stop for just a second and see if we have any questions before I go to the next fact pattern. Steve, I um, just had one All brief right. question. Uh, one brief question from the very beginning. Um, when you mentioned at the beginning, um, when you mentioned at the beginning um, something related to um, planning, maturity, or administration of the plan, you also mentioned another um, word that could be related to the administration of the plan. Do you recall what that word was? One of our attendees um, was asking that question. Oh, oh good. well, that's a good question. Um, I guess um, what I was referring to, I guess, is is instead of using the words when, when someone passes away or uh, when someone dies, uh, I was just using kind of a, a more modern term of just saying the plan is matured. You know, someone has passed away and uh, we can administer the estate now. The planning has matured in the sense that we planned during life, we planned for death, and now death has occurred. So the plan is matured, and now that plan has to be administered, whether it's a will or a trust, or even the, the brief administration of a transferable and death account just to make sure that everything is paid out properly. Uh, that's probably what I was getting at, and I apologize, I can't remember the exact word. All right, as we move along now, um, this is the hypothetical fact pattern number two. And Jeff, by the way, your audio is breaking up a little bit. You may want to move locations. I'm just giving you that heads up. Okay. Um, uh, so I this particular well fact that. pattern, we have a married couple. Uh, I do have one more question, Steve, uh, if you can and, uh, uh, hear me. Um, question yes. is... You mentioned there would not be any estate tax in your example. What about state estate tax? Isn't Maryland estate tax limit much lower than the $11 million federal limit? That's an excellent question, so thank you. Yes, I kind of skimmed over that, didn't I? So uh, the state of Maryland's estate estate tax exemption is $5 million per person, and um, you know, depending Depending on what the federal exemption amounts are in the future, the state amounts may fluctuate. So the state of Maryland says a single person can leave five million with no state estate tax. And we know Maryland is one of the only states in the country that has a state estate tax and an inheritance tax. So uh, I guess that's the situation for us here as Marylanders. Um, but in that, in that example, with Felix being a single person, he also would have no state estate tax. Thank you for pointing that out. Now, in this fact pattern, we have a, uh, you're welcome. We have a uh, married couple, uh, let's call them Jack and Janet. Uh, they have three children. And if we go down to the bottom of the slide, we see that they have a revocable living trust plan. So for those of you who are not familiar, a revocable trust is nothing more than a substitute for a will. I want you to think about it as a private agreement, a private contract that a person decides to have other than a will. Someone says, Someone I, says want I want to avoid the probate, probate of my estate in Maryland. So I'm going so to create a will, will so I'm going to create a contract. contract. That, is that, is contract. contract. that is what a revocable trust, trust is. is. And in this and case, in this we case, know that uh, when, when we have a person here who died, which is Jack, he's the husband, uh, he passed away first, unfortunately, at the early age of 69, and he left everything outright to his surviving spouse, Janet. Now, you'll notice that he left everything outright to Janet with a disclaimer. That is what we call um, an old-fashioned way of doing tax planning that is no longer needed in this environment for most people, but I'm going to explain that a little bit later. But what that means is Janet can make a tax election within nine months after, uh, after Jack's death to disclaim some of her assets and do 
uh, tax planning that is probably not realistic to try to explain today, but it's a tax planning device, mostly in this example, as opposed to what I would call a formula clause. So some of you uh, may have a document like this. Some of you may know someone who has a document like this. Perhaps they did estate planning as a couple uh, years ago in the late 90s or the early 2000s. And we were very concerned back then with, with estate tax because the estate tax exemptions were very low. A formula clause was a method that was used to make sure that the tax planning was done properly. A formula clause probably is not appropriate for most people today because of the huge exemption amounts that we have if we're talking about a married couple of $11.5 million per person or almost 23 over $23 million of exemption and $10 million of Maryland exemption for a couple. So uh, here we have a revocable trust that is relatively simple. Everything to the surviving spouse and the surviving spouse can make a tax election called a disclaimer if he or she needs to. And in this case, it's Janet, the she. Um, and uh, this revocable trust plan could be two separate revocable trusts. Perhaps Jack had his own trust and Janet has her own trust, or this could be one joint family trust. Let's just act as if Jack had his own trust. It'll be a little easier to understand, but whether it's a joint family revocable trust or two separate revocable trusts, the concept is the same. So here we see Jack has a residence. He has checking and savings and CDs. Um, he has uh, a lot of money in 401k. He has a joint brokerage account with Janet. He has life insurance and, and he has a Delaware residence. So he has a, a home down at the lower, slower shore, we call it. Uh, and uh, what a, that's a very nice thing. Now, one of the first things I would do here if, if I'm a trustee. So now remember, we are not talking about a probate estate, hopefully. What we've got here, if we're looking at this situation from, from Jack's date of death, we have a surviving spouse. So hopefully we have a situation here where the full administration of, of the estate is not going to be a big deal because we're not talking about the death of both spouses, we're talking about the death of one spouse. And, and most of the time, as we see here, everything is going to go to the surviving spouse. So the administration process here is going to be rather minimal. There are some things that need to be done, but it's going to be rather minimal compared to the example I used previously, because when Felix died, his entire estate had to be probated. Here, we simply are going to be repositioning assets to the surviving spouse, Janet, who has her own revocable trust. So the first thing we want to verify here and hopefully Jack and Janet verified this before Jack's death, and hopefully they had a good estate planning lawyer, and hopefully they had good fiduciary uh, uh, people involved, and they made sure that their revocable trust was what? Funded with assets. That assets were aligned with the trust. Because the first thing we wanna check here as trustees is, is the residence in the revocable trust, or trusts, is the cash, retitled in the name of the trust. Who are the beneficiaries? This is the same example as with Felix. The joint brokerage account, was that retitled in the name of the trust so that at Jack's death, there's no probate? Um, and of course, if it was in a joint account and it was not properly titled in the trust, there still would be no probate because it transfers to Janet. The Delaware residents, excuse me, I jumped over life insurance. Do we have beneficiaries for life insurance? Where is the life insurance going? The Delaware residents, was that titled in the name of the trust or trusts? So these are the first things that we want to verify because in this particular case, we hopefully will have no probate on Jack's death. Jack and Janet, in this example, uh, there's no reason to believe they are not a traditional couple. And what do we know about traditional couples? Well, most things are joint and uh, the couple is very comfortable. They've been married probably a long time, as I suspect these, these people have been. So let's just assume that the residence was titled in the trust or trust the way it's supposed to be. The cash was in the trust. 
the joint bank accounts, or excuse me, the joint brokerage account was in the trust. Let's pretend everything here was done properly. The life insurance is beneficiary designated and the Delaware residence is in the trust. So what do we know if we verify all that? Well, we know that there's no probate on any of those assets. We know that unless Jack has a vehicle in his own name, which there's no indication here, or unless he has a few savings bonds in his own name that Janet didn't know about, or unless he has a small account somewhere in his own name that she didn't know about, we know that here we're probably not looking at any probate. So from, from the perspective of planning, this is a plan that worked. This is a plan that has so far worked the way it's supposed to. So what are we going to do here as a trustee? Well, one decision to make is do we give notice to creditors? This is a, this is a traditional couple. They've accumulated nice assets in life. Uh, there's no reason to believe Jack has any creditors. But since 2014, we know that creditors can make a claim against a revocable trust. So let's say Jack has his own revocable trust. What might Janet do just to make sure that creditors are foreclosed from making a claim? Well, even though I personally have never seen a creditor make a claim against a revocable trust, Janet might be wise to, you know, just swallow hard and pay three or four hundred dollars to run notice to creditors to make sure that she's starting the six month process of saying, if you don't make a claim against Jack's trust for six months, then you can't make a claim against his trust. So that might just be a peace of mind thing. Another person may say, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to run notice to creditors. So we're going to now, we, we look to how Jack's revocable trust is written and we say, all right, there are no creditors or we're running notice to creditors. Um, when do we start this retitling process? So probably that would start fairly soon and the residence can be transferred to Janet, can be transferred to her trust. The checking savings and CDs are transferred to her trust. The 401k most likely is going to be beneficiary designated to Janet. Not always today with the SECURE Act and so forth, but probably 95% chance that's going to need to be have a death claim made and the, and the beneficiary will be Janet and she will set up her new rollover IRA. The joint brokerage account hopefully was in the trust if it was, Jack's portion is going to be moved into Janet's trust because she gets everything outright. If it was not in the trust, because here in the fact pattern, it was just a joint brokerage account. So now Janet has received that, and now what does she need to do? She needs to take that 600000 and put it in her trust because she's got a non-probate estate plan. She has her own trust. She wants to go on forward in life with that trust. She's going to make a death claim on the life insurance, and the Delaware residence was hopefully in the trusts, and that will be moved to Janet's trust. Now, I'm just checking with Jeff here. Is my audio good, Jeff? All right. Excuse me, Jeff. I'm just making sure what you're saying here. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jeff. So here uh, we have a situation where the planning is working the way we want, and now what are we worried about? We're worried about the same things that we are worried about in probate. We're worried about getting date of death values. We're worried about whether we have final tax returns filed. We're worried about whether Janet wants to make a disclaimer of the assets, and we know that right now she's not going to probably make any disclaimer because there's no need to. She has 23 million of exemption. She's going to file a federal estate tax return, in my opinion, and she's going to choose the portability election. That allows her to take Jack's 11 and a half million, transfer it to herself, and now she has $23 million of exemption that can never be taken away from her. She's locking in all those things. Um, and she's uh, just basically moving ahead with her life. So this is a relatively straightforward thing. What we still want to verify date of death values. We want to make the portability election within 24 months. We want to 
make any kind of disclaimer within nine months. And I just want to show this critical dates checklist for trusts. And as you see this, you'll see these things I'm talking about on this checklist. Uh, and we want to follow that checklist to make sure that nothing is missing. Now, Jeff has just asked me to speed up the presentation a little bit, which I'm going to do. Uh, and I just am slowed down here in the beginning to make sure that we're getting into the meat of the administration, which is most of what you've asked me to do today. This is an example now, sadly, 20 years later, Janet has passed away. And what do we know? Well, we know that now her assets have possibly changed, and hopefully she has updated those assets over the years, making sure that they are properly aligned with her revocable trust and her estate planning attorney and CPAs and financial advisors. We know that uh, her trust was fully funded, hopefully. It was properly done, and now there will be no probate at her death. So everything is done properly. But look at what's happened here in the intervening 20 years. Things do change, right? Things change over time, and they need to be updated over the years because of changes. But here, we have a situation where Janet probably didn't make certain changes she should have made, even though the estate plan is working as far as avoiding probate. So here we have one child who's disabled. One of the three children, God forbid, has suffered an injury. They have a traumatic brain injury. Janet is living at a CCRC, a retirement community. She has a deposit there. Hopefully that deposit was designated to the revocable trust at her death. Her checking and savings and CDs are in her trust, 375,000. Her IRA, plus the rollover IRA that she received from Jack is 1.2 million. Look at this stock market performance. She's done very well there. Uh, her $600,000 is up to 1.3 million 23 years later. Hopefully all those things are in her trust as, as retitled, except for the IRAs, which are beneficiary designated. She's bought a Florida residence, and hopefully that's in the trust. And in the last two examples, what do we know about these second residences? We know that if they are titled in the revocable trust, that they are avoiding, or Janet is avoiding probate in Delaware. If she still had the Delaware property, she's still avoiding probate in Florida. So uh, that is a non-probate thing. But what do we have here? She made no gifts during life, but she has several creditors. I know that's a bit of an odd fact pattern, but uh, here she may have may have run up some credit cards and she wasn't behaving normally as she would have when she was younger. So here we want to run notice to creditors. We want to identify date of death values. We want to make sure we are facilitating the transfer, the, date, the death claims and the transfer of the IRAs to the children, okay? Making sure the children can set up their own inherited IRAs, and everything is going equally. And look at this one thing at the bottom of the slide. All the assets are going into further trust. So Jack and Janet were smart. They were concerned about asset protection for their children, and they have further trust. So not only is Janet's trust going to be administered, but the assets for the children are going into further trust to protect them from bad marriages and creditors and bankruptcy and so forth. Uh, but the problem here is the trust that is left for the disabled child, that trust is not a supplemental needs trust. That is a general needs trust. So we may need to be concerned and we should be concerned as trustees, we should be concerned about the after the administration process, which we're going to get into in just a second. We need to be concerned with how is this going to be distributed? So possibly the document allows for the flexibility, meaning Janet's trust may allow for the flexibility to leave assets in a certain way for the disabled child. That is going to be more advantageous, a supplemental needs trust instead of a general needs trust. But if it doesn't allow for that, which many modern documents do allow, there may need to be a decanting of this trust, meaning a changing of this trust through other state decanting laws like Virginia, Delaware, Nevada, and other places that have decanting laws to make sure that child is not going to be disqualified from waiver programs or other traumatic brain injury resources that this person might be eligible for. 
I'm going to quickly go to the fourth fact pattern. This is the fact pattern where we have no estate plan and we have someone who has a very unique situation, but I have actually seen this in my practice. Uh, even though it does sound somewhat far-fetched, it isn't. This person dies and was married, but separated. And uh, he had two children. His name was Ricardo. And his spouse actually belongs to a, uh, a community that lives out west. And so there's a lot of ambiguity here. Now, after the last two examples, we are back to an estate. We are not in a trust. This is an estate. Because what do we know about probate? Wills, by their very nature, are subject to probate. But estate plans that basically don't exist, meaning no estate plan, no will, no trust, the state of Maryland has its own plan, and that is called the laws of intestacy. So here, Ricardo dies without a will. His personal representative will have to be appointed. That means that a petition for probate will have to be filed by someone, and that person will have to ask to be appointed. That is called judicial probate. That person may or may not have to get the permission of many people, but here we know we have two children. So probably one of those children, if, if Maria is not available and is not going to come probate Ricardo's estate, which she may, but if one of those two children may have to come forward, petition for probate, hopefully get the consent of all beneficiaries, and then be appointed as the personal representative. Here we have checking. $3,100 in probate. IRAs hopefully have beneficiaries. All the same fact pattern that we talked about with Felix in the first example. We want to get the estate open, get control of the assets with a letter of administration. We want to make sure the IRAs have beneficiaries. And if they do, we're going to facilitate the transfer of new or the, the setting up of new inherited IRAs. If there are no beneficiaries, we're going to make a claim on that and the 298,000, unfortunately, would be part of the estate. Here we have another situation where we see life insurance has no beneficiary. That then would unfortunately be part of the estate. Um, and then we see savings bonds. So we're back to the savings bonds issue. Savings bonds are part of the probate estate unless there's transferable on death, excuse me, payable on death, or there's a joint owner. Here we have an unusual situation. Uh, Ricardo made a lifetime gift of $500,000. So even though he does not have a, a large estate per se, um, he has at some point in his life had a lot of funds and he made gifts. Perhaps he made these gifts to his children. Perhaps he made a gift to another person. Uh, this is a very odd family situation, but those exist. So we have to recognize that he's made lifetime gifts, but even though he has, he has a gift exemption during his life of 11.58 million. And we know that by making this $500,000 gift, he used a chunk of that, but he still has close to or, or more than 11 million left of his exemption. Uh, and so this is just one of those examples where there's no plan. Just remember, in this example, there is still probate, even though there's no will, and there has to be an accounting. This is going to be a regular estate because it's more than $50,000. I know you'll notice that I included the federal pension here because I want to show you that the personal representative would hopefully be in touch with the Office of Personnel Management uh, because maybe Maria is not going to be involved. So this is one of those things that this situation is going to present all kinds of ambiguities and challenges that the personal representative will have to overcome. So I spent a great deal of time, 45 minutes or more on those facts in fact, patterns, and I hope that's been good to give you more of a, of a, of a found, foundation or groundwork of, of not the, the entire administration, but at least how to get the administration started and to get it going. Um, in either of these, ex or any of these examples about revocable trusts or wills, remember, fiduciary responsibility at the death of a surviving spouse or the death of a single person is to account for all assets and to protect yourself from liability if you're a fiduciary. So with that, let's move on. So we want to have empathy as we move on now from the examples. We want to have empathy for the situation and, and that's very important and I don't have to tell you that, you know that intuitively, 
this is one of the worst times of someone's life. I was notified this morning of a death of someone who was a client, and uh, you know, this is the kind of situation we're talking about here. Uh, what kind of family support does this person need? And making sure they understand that support is available. Uh, if you're a professional advisory firm, uh, I su suggest that your entire firm be involved in this support. Be creative, let the person know, either prior to the death or after, uh, all kinds or both, all kinds of resources that are available. Have the ability to act as a counselor and also to refer the person to a counselor or coordinator. Now we want to assure that the clients take care of themselves. We talked about, uh, excuse me, we want to make sure that the, uh, the personal representative or trustee, who may also be a client if you're a professional, uh, takes care of themselves first. And remember I said in most circumstances, not all, there's no hurry. We want to assure someone that we're, the, or the family, if you're a person who's a private person who's acting in this role, you want to assure the family that they're going to be notified and people are going to be coordinating, advisors are going to be coordinating. Not all families get along. There are certain beneficiaries that are disinherited. Um, there are people who are going to be difficult to coordinate with or don't even want to talk to you. So these are the challenges. Um, we want to assure a surviving spouse, for example, that funds are available. Or if there are disabled people in the family, that funds hopefully were planned for that will be available. Uh, we want to deal with final arrangements if they haven't already been made. So that's something to think about. It's hard to do. Most of the time, the person would have made those final arrangements in their advanced medical directive or outside of that. Um, we want to talk about family-related issues. So if there are challenges with people uh, who are uncooperative or they are disgruntled, we want to know that as fast as we can and try to figure out a way of dealing with that. Of course, we want to send uh, and be sem sensitive to people by sending uh, sympathy bouquets of flowers, attending funerals and memorial services. These are things that are very high level and best practices. So the legal steps that need to be taken after death, which we've talked a little about so far, probate in our two examples of Felix and Ricardo, non-probate in, in our examples of Jack and Janet, largely non-probate, these are similar processes. What I'm trying to drive home with those examples is there are people who believe there is no administration necessary in a trust administration, meaning they feel that if it's a revocable trust, for example, because there's no probate, there has to be no administration. And that is not true. Now, there are times when someone who's a single person, for, say, for example, uh, they have a perfectly done revocable trust, their assets are perfectly situated, they maybe have one child, um, that goes to the, everything goes to the child at the death of the person, there is no, no one to really account to. Those are exceptions. Those kinds of situations work beautifully where administration is pretty minimal. But where we have more than one sibling and kind of conventional situations, uh, Checklists and critical dates and organization is absolutely essential to fulfill your fiduciary responsibility. So we talked about a little bit of this in our examples. Date of death, we have death certificates issued. This many times happens with funeral directors. Other times there are situations, for example, during COVID-19, we had many clients out of this New York area uh, having difficulty getting a, a letters of administration excuse me, we having difficulty getting death certificates and letters of administration. We know that inventories, we, we talked about when is the register of wills or when do we have to give the register of wills exact numbers about values. Remember that's done on the inventory within three months of the date of death, excuse me, three months of the time the estate is open. The, the information report is filed with the inventory most of the time and the information report is going to tell the Register of Wills whether anyone is subject to inheritance tax, because remember the Register of Wills collects inheritance tax. And then you'll see certain, certain dates that are critical, claims against the estate, the spousal election is due within nine months of the date of death, and you need to know, even though it's beyond today's discussion, you need to know that 
uh, we have a new spousal elective share law in Maryland. And as a fiduciary, you need to be educated about that because the new spousal elective share law says that a spouse has a right to make a claim of one third, at least, against almost all assets, although it's formulaic, not just probate assets. So that's something where a, a spouse passed away but did not leave everything to their surviving spouse. That surviving spouse has certain rights to make a spousal election. Uh, and for the new spousal elective share, the new law will be effective this fall. Disclaimers are due within nine months of the date of death. We talked about that. The federal estate tax return is due, or the state estate tax return is due within nine months. But the portability election we talked about for spouses is not due for 24 months. And then I'm going to keep going. The Q-tip election. Now, in this example, we talked about Jack leaving Janet everything outright. What if Jack had died and left Janet a marital trust? What if Jack had said, hey, I want to give Janet asset protection upon my death. And I also want to make sure that at her death, everything goes to my children. I don't, I want to have some form of control. Then we would be worried about establishing a marital trust. And that would require what is called the Q-tip election. Qualified terminal interest property is the, is the uh, description of the acronym. And that is due in 15 months. The good news is the Q-tip election and the portability election are made on the same 706, the estate tax return for federal purposes. The first administration account in an estate is due within nine months after the letters of administration and so forth. Um, retirement plan accounts have to, be re have to be established by a certain timeline beginning with September of the year following someone's death, September of the year following someone's death, and we have to be aware of the new rules about the SECURE Act. And the SECURE Act is a discussion in and of itself, and if you have questions about that, Jeff is happy to send you a SECURE Act presentation webinar, or I'm sure we're going to be doing more of those this year and next year. Now, Jeff, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna stop, excuse me, and just ask if there are any other questions and how long are we going to today? Um, to answer that question, Steve, um, we have Sorry. up until 1.30. Um, we do have another question uh, from the uh, attendee. And that question is, is there never probate if there is a revocable trust? And Jeff, can you repeat that again? Is the question, is there probate in a revocable trust? Is there never probate if there is a revocable trust? Oh, that's a great question. So thank you. So uh, great question. So let's say we have a revocable trust and let's just take uh, Janet's example, the third illustration that I gave where the surviving spouse, Janet, had passed away. Let's pretend that everything was properly situated. It was beneficiary designated if it was an IRA or insurance policy, or if it wasn't, if it was a non-retirement asset like cash or brokerage accounts or the real estate, everything was in the revocable trust. However, let's say that Janet, when she was running up those credit cards where I was kind of making up that story about how we got creditors there, Let's say that she also kind of decided to invest some money in a wild uh, uh, activity like she wanted to do some of her own investing. So she opened up an account at a brokerage firm and put $100,000 in there. And she was enjoying trading stocks because let's say her son was insisting on managing all of her assets or she wanted to just have some freedom. But when she opened up that $100,000 brokerage account, she forgot to title that in the name of her trust. So in my example there, uh, we've got Janet with most of her assets in the trust and, and designated properly, and she's got this $100,000 asset that is not in her trust, and it's in her sole name with no beneficiary and no joint owner. So now, your question is a very good one. Janet will have probate. She'll actually have probate on that $100,000, and that will be a regular estate and she will also have non-probate. So it is possible to have a revocable trust and have probate even though you have the trust. So that's what we want to avoid. We want 
through maintenance and updating throughout the years, we want to avoid that situation. It's not the end of the world, but it is a form of the plan failing and not working the way it's supposed to. Now, I'm going to go right in now and finish. Uh, I promise we will not be going to 1.30, which you're probably thankful for that. I will leave time for questions at the end. What is the legal step-by-step -step process that needs to be taken at death in probate? So remember, we have to decide what is our fiscal year for the estate, because remember, the estate will have a 1041. It will have a fiduciary income tax return. So for those of you who may get confused about this, remember we have the decedent's final tax return, the person who died, their 1040. Now we have the 1041 for the estate of the decedent. This would be the same thing if we had a revocable trust. And remember, we're administering the trust after someone's death. The income tax is going to be reported on the 1041. And then we have the estate federal and state tax return for uh, the ex for determining whether the decedent owed any state or federal estate tax. All right, fiduciary tax returns, we just talked about that and they're due within a certain period of time. Uh, we want to possibly wait for a closing letter. So here's an example. When Janet died, were all of her tax returns filed on time? And now we just have to file her final return. Or uh, when Janet died, God forbid, she didn't file her income tax returns for the last three years, where the, the trustee in that example or personal representative is responsible, let's say, for making sure those final tax returns are filed and making sure there's no uh, liability to Uncle Sam or the state of Maryland. Now, again, we want to do the same things that we've been talking about in non-probate as we do in probate. Again, what I'm driving home here is that whether it's a probate estate or a non-probate estate, many of the things we want to do to ensure that we're at, at a very high level of fiduciary performance and many of the things that we want to do to satisfy our fiduciary responsibility are similar. We want to get date of death values. These are done through appraisals, valuations of brokerage accounts, valuations of businesses, those types of things. Beneficiaries are entitled to notice. We didn't talk too much about this in my example of probate, but when you filed your petition for probate, you actually had to give the register of wills the names of the interested persons. And the names of interested persons are, in a nutshell, the people who are in the will, the people who are named in the will, and the people who would have inherited, this is a little bit uh, uh, non-intuitive, the people that would have inherited if there was no will. Those are the, the uh, interested persons. Now, since 2014, in accordance with the Maryland Trust Act, beneficiaries have to, have to be notified. They are entitled to notice under revocable trust as well. And here we see we have a non-probate estate. Let's say we have Janet's trust and we're, we're administering that trust. Are we going to file notice to creditors? Well, we better because she does have creditors. Uh, um, the spousal election, we have to worry about that even though it's not yet in effect, it's going to be this fall. Do we have to make the Q-tip election? Well, in Janet's case, Jack has died and left no marital trust, and now she's passed away. So this doesn't really apply to her because she's the surviving spouse. Uh, the portability election would not have applied to her in her case because she's the surviving spouse, but it would have applied. The Q-tip election and the portability election would have applied to her at Jack's death because he was the first spouse to die. And for those of you who are single or you're administering the estates of single people, I apologize. A lot of this material uh, has to do with the nuances of administering the estate for, a, for spouses, but many of these responsibilities are the same whether a person is single or married. And again, we have the same concerns about retirement plans. They have to be claimed and they, the, the plan administrator has to receive the documents and the retirement plan, the IRA, has to be separated into new IRA shares by December 31st of the year following death. So we have all these timelines, plus we wanna be aware 
of the SECURE Act and what it means, and is there a beneficiary who is exempt? So let's talk about the SECURE Act very quickly. The SECURE Act stops beneficiaries unless there is an exception, stops most beneficiaries from being able to receive their inherited IRA and stretch that inherited IRA out for their entire lifetime. This has been something we've accepted as normal in our lives for the last 30, 40 years. Now, because of the SECURE Act as of January 1st, 2020, you cannot do that if you're a healthy beneficiary. Now, this does not apply to spouses. It does not apply to uh, ch children that are minors, minors only, uh, children. It does not apply to chronically ill individuals, and it does not apply to uh, disabled individuals, someone who has a supplemental needs trust or special needs trust, and it does not apply to siblings who are not more than 10 years younger than you. So let's say you had an older sibling, SECURE Act does not apply to them. If you had a younger sibling, but that sibling was only eight years younger than you, uh, SECURE Act does not apply to them. So all of those people who are exempt, those people can stretch out their IRAs when they receive them for their entire lifetime, but not uh, anyone else because there, are no, there is no exception. And what we're dealing with there is that person, if the planning is done properly, that person can only stretch out the IRA for 10 years. And then all the IRA money has to be distributed out. That creates a tax situation, okay? And maybe as a fiduciary, what you need to know is who are the except, exceptions, who is, who is exempt, who is not exempt. And you also want to be aware that even for those people who are exempt, the limited group of people who are exempt, if the planning is not done properly, those people can still be subject to the default rule, which is five years. So we have a 10-year new rule for normal beneficiaries, healthy beneficiaries. We have the exceptions to the SECURE Act, people who can stretch out retirement plans without paying tax for their entire lives. But then we have the old default rule, which is five years or less, and we know that if planning is not done correctly for even those who are ex exempt, that it could cause the five-year rule to kick in. So we have to be aware of that as a fiduciary. Again, here we're looking at non-probate. We're talking about the process of non-probate. Now, when we're dealing with probate, probate in an estate, we have a process where at the final administration, when the final administration account is filed with the Register of Wills and beneficiaries are given a 20-day notice period to object, then what happens is the court puts its blessing on that and says, we are making this order for distribution final, and that is covering you as the personal representative in, in a big way that's giving you the authority to go ahead under court order and go ahead and administer and distribute the trust excuse me, administer and distribute the estate. What this is saying in this slide is if we are dealing with a non-probate estate like Janet's, let's pretend, let's forget my example of the brokerage account where she put $100,000 in a brokerage account outside of the trust. Let's just imagine that her trust was fully funded. It was perfect. If you are the trustee of that trust, you have the right to ask for the beneficiaries, and remember there were three children and one of them had a brain injury, but at least for the two children, you have the right to ask them to sign a release and a waiver and a refunding agreement saying, I'm getting ready to distribute this to you. Here's a copy of the accounting, because remember you've accounted to them, and uh, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I've accounted for every dime. Please sign off on this and release me from liability and say you're accepting uh, the uh, accounting, and I will go ahead and make the distribution. And by the way, if I made a distribution to you and Uncle Sam comes back and says they still want more money, or something happens where I, as the trustee, am still liable to pay someone that I didn't foresee, you agree to refund some of the money. So just know that in a non-probate trust administration, you have the right to be released from liability before making the uh, distribution. 
you'll notice that the tax requirements and filings are the same, the same concerns that we have. So we've talked about examples, we've talked about the process, we've talked about checklists, and by the way, again, notice that one of these checklists is for estates, one of them is for trusts, and uh, these are for your educational purposes. So what are the practical steps that we can do or should be done when someone is dealing with a death? Well, first of all, I think that a meeting needs to be scheduled with the, the fiduciary or the, the, the personal representative that's going to petition or the trustee that's going to be the trustee within 30 days, certainly no more than 30 days. Now, if the meeting doesn't occur until after that, which it usually doesn't, it's not the end of the world. But what we don't want is for someone to feel like they have to come in and start this process within five days. It's just not necessary in most cases. We want to coordinate with the financial and the tax advisors and the legal advisors that are involved in this person's life. Or if this person is a surviving spouse, uh, hopefully their children have some familiarity with the advisors. Again, we want to use checklists. We want to be organized. Practically speaking, we want to have an inclusive process. There may be difficult beneficiaries. They have a right to information, but they do not have a right in estates. In estates, they do not have a right to all information. So there's a little nuance between administering an estate, a probate estate, and a trust. In a revocable trust administration where the beneficiaries get notice, they have a right to all information. And we can withhold that information, uh, but Many times it's not wise to do that. So this is a due diligence exercise. Um, this is a judgment call about, you know, do I just go ahead and, 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 and be transparent as the trustee, which you probably will be uh, for better or for worse. In an estate, not all information has to be shared with difficult beneficiaries. And this is a nuance. And know that if you are acting as a personal representative or trustee, uh, there is professional help available either through our firm or other competent lawyers that can help represent you through the process of administration. We want to do due diligence and just make sure the surviving spouse is um, coping, that they have resources. Uh, again, we don't want to be hurried, even though some surviving spouses are not good in this regard and they will not listen. They feel that uh, they are driven to get this process started, even though it's painful to watch, you have to expect that and understand that some people are going to do that. Um, surviving spouses, uh, these very same people, they should be encouraged, and, and most of the time they do want to do their own estate planning. But again, this is not something that has to be done under those kinds of, of, of terrible circumstances until, um, un unless there's other circumstances of health or others to deal with. Organizational and general readiness. Again, what you're doing today, listening to this workshop, having this presentation as a resource, which hopefully you will scan and uh, into your system, and so you always have it. Um, traditional storage. Uh, do we, uh, if if we know of, uh, that we're going to be administering someone's estate, do we know where things are located? Does the person that we are going to act for, uh, do they have paper records? Are they big computer people and have everything scanned? Do they have spreadsheets of assets? Do we know where their bonds, their savings bonds are? Are they in a safe deposit box? Um, does this person use a digital archive? Do they have um, a digital list of their assets? Do they have digital assets themselves? Does this person own a business? Do they have uh, a domain that, that a domain name that's worth a lot of money? Um, does this person have a huge Facebook account that has thousands of photos on it? Uh, we need to organize and hopefully be able to tackle something like this that's organized. Most of the time it isn't, as we know, but these are the things that you would be looking for. And you should know with regard to electronic assets or digital assets, you as a personal representative or trustee or even during life as a power of attorney for someone, under Maryland law, you have the right, uh, if that person has provided you the power and authority under documents, you have the right to, um, to be able to obtain information about digital assets. Now, as we start to wrap up, what are the most significant problems 
and legal and tax issues advisors should be aware of. And I realize that there are non-financial and non-tax advisors in the, in the audience, uh, but this will be instructive, I think. We want to review titling, obviously, prior to death. And many of you do a great job with that, uh, collaborating with lawyers, collaborating with Elville and Associates, uh, assuring that assets are aligned properly, and encouraging clients to maintain and update their plans. We appreciate that. We appreciate you encouraging and being on the front lines of, of, of giving people the awareness that they need to be updating. Uh, valuation of all assets after death. This is something that can linger. This is something that can, can, can be something that kind of continues for many months, and it really shouldn't. This should be one of the first thing that's done, first things that's done uh, as soon as the, the fiduciary gets their feet on the ground and starts moving forward, is to start marshalling the assets of the person and trying to establish date of death values. You can't do this very well until you get appointed as a personal representative in an estate, so know that it could be a little bit of a challenge there. We don't want to retitle assets in the name of a surviving spouse or beneficiary too soon. So I would just say, without going into great depth on this, uh, with, there are times when surviving spouses retitle things in their names very quickly. There are times when uh, uh, children and surviving spouses go ahead and retitle things in the name of the surviving spouse when they weren't supposed to. I'll give you an example, and maybe you've seen this. Uh, a, a couple. Uh, one of the spouses passes away. There's supposed to be a marital trust or a, some other kind of trust for the surviving spouse. And by the time you get notified or that by the time the, the, uh, the attorney gets notified, this, the family has already retitled assets in the sole name of the survivor, which was contrary to what the, the, the deceased spouse wanted to happen. So retitling can happen too soon and it shouldn't until the step-by-step -step process is taken, generally speaking. Inheritance tax. Remember that inheritance tax can be an issue. Who collects the inheritance tax? The Register of Wills. Generally speaking, the inheritance tax in Maryland is 10% on non-lineal descendants. I like to think of it, with a couple of exceptions, I like to think of it as nieces and nephews and beyond. Those people, friends, cousins, those people are entitled, excuse me, are subject to 10% Maryland inheritance tax. Now, inheritance tax can be due rather quickly if someone passes away with an IRA and leaves that to the beneficiaries. Inheritance tax is technically due at that time, whereas the other non-retirement assets, inheritance tax is generally not due until the time of distribution. So there can be times when inheritance tax needs to be assessed by the Register of Wills twice and not just once at the end. And you have to be very careful with that as a financial advisor and also as a um, fiduciary because the Register of Wills can assess penalties on the inheritance tax and you don't want to do something that would get you removed as the trustee or the personal representative. The portability election, thankfully, uh, excuse me, one more thing I wanted to backtrack on on the inheritance tax. Remember that if someone who is subject to inheritance tax, let's say a niece, receives a gift, but it's been more than two years since the time this person received a lifetime gift, then she avoids the inheritance tax, even though she was subject to the inheritance tax if the person had given her the gift and then died. But if the person gives her the gift and she survives, uh, the person who gave the gift survives more than two years, there is no inheritance tax. The portability election, we talked about that. Uh, 24 months, thankfully, Uncle Sam is allowing to make that election. Q-tip election is made within 15 months. This is generally required when we have a marital trust that's going to be established, okay? Uh, and then issues here where someone had creditors, but they did not give notice to creditors. Again, with revocable trust, I personally have never seen creditors make a claim against a revocable trust, but I think that it's possible and it's something that the fiduciary needs to be aware of because ultimately they are responsible. So I strongly advise our, our advisors and our collaborative team to communicate completely together, to have a meeting face-to-face -face when things are better, or to have a Microsoft Teams or other kind of meeting virtually to, to, to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And who will quarterback this? 
who will coordinate with the client. If you're not a financial advisor and you're going to be the fiduciary, I would demand of my advisory team, the attorney, the CPA involved, and so forth, uh, that uh, and financial advisor involved, that everybody work together. And I would demand to know how it's going to be coordinated because that's not an easy thing to do, even though we want to do that. Um, we should be you know, investing significant time to make sure all prop assets are properly aligned. We don't want to have, from a planning point of view, we don't want to have a beautiful plan, but the assets go elsewhere. We don't want to have that situation. We don't want to have a situation where assets are exempt from income tax, or at least exempt at death from income tax until they're used, and then cause a situation where the estate uh, causes an income tax on otherwise non-taxable assets. We want to expedite meetings and plan for if someone is ill. Obviously, that's common sense, but it would be shocking to you to find out how many law firms, how many advisors do not uh, hurry things up, even when they know that there's an ominous situation. So we want to make sure that happens. And we want to encourage clients to use instructions. We want them to include a letter of wishes, or if we wanted to call it a letter of intent or a memorandum of intent, we want them to customize their estate plan, tell their fiduciaries, what are the nuances? What is their thinking? What are their goals? It can't do anything but two things, personalize the person's estate plan and also give the fiduciary special instructions that I'm sure would be very useful given the person's personal concerns. We want to utilize advanced organizational tools during life. If you don't know what those are, Jeff and I or your advisor can tell you. We want to encourage the education of family members. We don't want to just appoint people as fiduciaries. We want to make sure they're educated and know what to do. Uh, this can preserve the value of the estate. It can also uh, just make sure that disputes are minimized and that everyone is on the same page. Uh, again, we want the advisors to be coordinated. We want a systematic method. We want to be able to disseminate information quickly, and we want to instill confidence in people that this is actually going to happen and that there's a mechanism to do that. So Jeff, I wanted to get through there because I know I spent a lot of time on the examples, uh, and Jeff, rightly so, told me to speed it up a little bit. Um, we still have time for questions. I know that's an awful lot to throw at you. I didn't stop talking almost the whole time, and I appreciate you listening very intently to this very dense information. Some of you already know a lot of these things. Some of you, this is new for you. I'm gonna open it up now for questions, but I want you to know we, are, we wanna be a resource to you. The advisors who know us at Elville & Associates want to be a resource to you. They are tremendous. They believe in the same things we do, uh, or whether they're tax advisors or financial advisors that it is in clients' best interest to have education and to have the support of a team. So Jeff, with that, I'll turn it over to you for questions, if any. Thanks, Steve. Um, first, uh, a virtual hand to Steve for a job well done. Um, I uh, listen to that uh, on a quarterly basis and uh, always learn something. So, But I will never give that presentation mm -hmm. since I'm not a lawyer. So. Um, so thank you, Steve. We do have one question, um, and it uh, looks like it's a little bit of a two-part question. So I'm gonna try to get through it here. Um, could you please address the two times charge possibly assessed by the Registry of Wills? Also, could he please review the two-year deal? How would that even happen? Plus, under 15,000 is never assessed an inheritance tax, though, right? The questions above relate to an inherit to inheritance tax. And All right, thank you for that question. So I did bring up a little bit of a nuance issue there. So let's talk about the inheritance tax. So again, the inheritance tax is assessed by the Register of Wills, and the person who is responsible for making sure that this assessment occurs is the fiduciary, the trustee or the personal representative. Now, uh, I have never heard of a $15,000 limit on the Register of Wills assessing inheritance tax. You may or may not be referring to the annual exclusion amount 
which is 15,000 per person per year that can be gifted and Uncle Sam doesn't really even care about that. So that's the exclusion from, from annual gift tax. In other words, that's the amount that can be given tax-free for sure. So you may or may not have meant to include that into in the issue of inheritance tax. So now I'll address your other two questions. So the Register of Wills basically says that if I make a gift to my niece, so let's just pretend I gave my niece $100,000, well, my niece is subject to inheritance tax at my death. But if I died four years later, which is, of course, beyond two years, if I died three years later, which is beyond two years, my niece would not be subject to inheritance tax. But let's say I died um, one year later, God forbid. Now, you may have remembered that I mentioned that three months after opening an estate, you have to file the inventory and the information report. The information report looks fairly simple. It has four questions on it. But in that example where I gave my niece $100,000 and then I died a year later, I did not get past the two years where she would be exempt from inheritance tax. So my personal representative or trustee would have a responsibility. So let's talk about the personal representative. Let's say I had a will, I had an estate. My personal representative has to has to notify the Register of Wills by the information report, by checking a box that says, I gave a gift within two years of my death to someone who was subject to inheritance tax. So that is their responsibility to disclose that. Now, if they don't disclose that, uh, which is their duty, then the Register of Wills may never know any better. But their duty is to fulfill the tax laws of Maryland and to make sure that happens, then the Register of Wills would assess inheritance tax. Now, let's say that I didn't have a probate estate and I had a revocable living trust and I made a $100,000 gift to my niece. I was never going to have a probate estate. I did everything perfectly and my revocable trust had no probate. Nothing was going to go through probate. Now I die a year later. My trustee has the same responsibility. That person, even though I did not have a will-based or probate-based plan, my trustee has to file an application to fix inheritance tax. So there's a form called Application to Fix Inheritance Tax on Non-Probate Assets. I know that's a mouthful, but that's the form that has to be given to the Register of Wills. Now, you may say, well, gee, Steve, the revocable trust has nothing to do with the Register of Wills. That is correct, except my fiduciary has a responsibility to let the Register of Wills know that there will be inheritance tax that needs to be assessed. So that should answer the question about uh, the lifetime gift. And then the two-part thing that I was talking about is this. I had an experience as a very young lawyer that woke me up to this idea right away when I was administering the estate once as a very young lawyer years and years ago where someone passed away and left a fairly significant amount of retirement assets to two nieces. And so I, uh, it wasn't in Howard County, uh, and they also had a fair amount of non-retirement assets that were going to be distributed to the nieces. So I was going about my merry way administering the estate, and uh, lo and behold, I got a call that said, hey, you were supposed to inform the Register of Wills that these two nieces received the IRA money, which was about 400,000 apiece. They received that IRA money with only about, within only about two months of the person's death. Whereas there I was six or seven or eight months later still administering the estate and I was going to report that to the Register of Wills at that time. I was going to say, this is the amount that's getting ready to be distributed to the nieces from, the, from all the assets, please give me uh, an, an assessment of inheritance tax. And of course, we were going to account for all the money and the Register of Wills was going to get all their inheritance tax money, but the Register of Wills in many counties will take the position that my responsibility was to let them know when those beneficiaries received the, the IRAs and they received them pretty quickly, I was supposed to let the Register of no Wills know at that time so they could assess the $40,000 of inheritance tax on that $400,000 IRA at that time. And then when the balance of the estate was distributed years, or not years later, months later, 
I was supposed to inform the Register of Wills again to assess inheritance tax prior to the distribution. So that's what I meant by that two-part thing. As a fiduciary, you need to be aware that if retirement plan assets get distributed quickly, you may have an obligation to, in the county that you're working in to give the Register of Wills notice twice about the inheritance tax. Thank you, Steve. So last call for questions, everyone. We do have one more. Question is, is the Maryland inheritance tax applicable when estates of Maryland residents, regardless of the residency of the recipients? Yes, I think uh, I'd have to see the particular situation you're referring to, but I think if I understand your question, generally speaking, the answer is yes. If you are a resident of Maryland and leaving assets to non-Maryland beneficiaries, uh, then the inheritance tax still applies. Very good, thank you. So last call for questions. And while we're waiting for maybe those last couple questions, um, I'll say a couple things to finish up. I uh, wanna thank you for attending. We appreciate your support of our webinar series um, and uh, certainly hope to see you sometime down the road back here in our office here at uh, Columbia Gateway Parkway. Um, a couple things. Um, we do have a, a few more webinars coming up very soon. We have a trustee workshop next Tuesday at 11. Um, we have our friends at Maryland ABLE um, presenting on the 22nd at 10 a.m. And for advisors, we have our next advisors forum on uh, July 10th at 1230 and invitations for that are going to be forthcoming. Also want to let you know, Elvill and Associates is celebrating its 10 year anniversary today. Um, and we are very um, blessed um, uh, to say that we're doing that. And um, we've gone from, I've been here for seven years. Um, I've known Steve for, I think probably about 18 years. Um, so we've gone from two employees to 19 employees and have grown steadily over the years. Um, and uh, we couldn't have done it without you, people like you, and wanna thank you for your support over the years. Um, uh, we've done it by taking care of clients, um, focusing on education, uh, collaborative with our clients and our advisor community, um, and being compassionate in everything we do, um, in every, every single thing we do every day with our clients and our communities that we serve. So. Thank you for being part of Elvill and Associates. We do appreciate it. Look forward to being here for many, many years to come. Uh, we, we do appreciate uh, um, you being part of it. So um, and there are no other questions. We see some congratulations coming through. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Very kind. Um, you will receive a survey uh, immediately after the webinar is over. Um, if you would, be so kind to send in your comments uh, about um, today's uh, webinar. We really appreciate that. Um, give us your thoughts about the content. Um, give us your thoughts about the setup. We're always trying to tweak it and um, you know make it perfect um, for our attendees. Also, it's your time to um, request a, a meeting with Steve to discuss your um, planning, anything related to planning. Um, a lot of our consultations are at no cost, so um, take that time to, you know, use this education that you've just um, uh, just gone through and put it to use, um, put it into action, and uh, take that next step. We encourage that. So, um, if there are no other questions, let me just double check. There are none. We'll go ahead and call this webinar to an end. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you very much. Have a great day.